This is the day the Lord has made. We rejoice and we are glad in it. Let me express my genuine appreciation to everyone responsible for my being here on tonight. I've been encouraged by what I have heard and what I have witnessed. Now, if you're waiting on me to do what Charlie and Mason did, you <laughs> invited the wrong person. <clears throat> what a gathering of believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. I was reflecting with my son today and said to him that if no one joins this, in quote, movement, there are enough of us here tonight, today and tomorrow, to make a difference in our communities. I'm committed to stand with you. We stand together to bring unity to reality. That's what my assignment was. It's been given to me to speak the church without walls. How can God use a unified church to, dis to serve our divided communities? I thought about that because most of us are conversant in some way or another with groups and individuals that have tried to usher in unity. <laughs> My mind went back to Alexander the Great in 323 BC. He died after he had conquered the most visible empire in the world, Rome, and then drank itself to death. He held up an image of loving cups. And it was the image that we could, in unity, drink together, that we could be one. But he died from a wine cup, and the world never experienced the unity cup. The 19th century, the 20th, and the 21st century have encountered people that have tried to usher in unity. In the 19th century, the Shakers, this community of celibate people that worked shoulder to shoulder with the task, but because they were celibate, they died out. <laughs> and then at a lower level, we remember when Jim Jones led a community of people as a demonic influence to their own demise. And then David Koresh, in a fiery end with his people. Or we think back in the days when we had to study church history and we remember the Qumran community and we had to study the monastic community of Catholicism, our not so long ago, the hippie movement of the 60s. Now the Qumran community, you just go and see its relics by the Dead Sea, and that community of monks, they fight over the very terra firma under the basilica, where Jesus was supposed to have been crucified and resurrected. That's a mess. Hippies have turned in their beetles for RVs, and now their grandparents and great-grandparents. And every movement that we look at in past, none have been able to bring about unity. So the question was asked to me, Ralph, the church without walls, how can God use a unified church to serve our divided communities? An illustration for geometry might help tonight. Two points coming 
to a central focus by the very law of geometry, can't get to the center without the two points getting closer together. If Christ is our center and we're drawn close to him, we had better get close if we're going to make it to the center. So, for the third time, I was asked, Pastor West, because that's what I am, a pastor, how can God use the unified church? So allow me to offer up two or three or four suggestions. The first is, Pray for unity. Doesn't sound that weighty. But unity is donated by God, and so we have to pray for unity. It can't be manufactured or fabricated or organized, so you have to pray that God give us unity. In John chapter 17, Jesus is coming to the end of his earthly ministry. And the final petitionary ministry that he has before his disciples is that he's going to pray a prayer. And the entire focus of that prayer hangs on one phrase of petition. Lord, that you might make them one. As the Father and the Son are one, that you would make them one. One. That was his prayer. He would pray this prayer before his very disciples. And he would pray that prayer because there were some other things I assume he could have prayed if he wanted to pray. See, the time of the prayer was Thursday night. The place of the prayer, some have suggested that he entered into maybe the temple, because at Passover, this was the one time that the gates would be open all night. And some say that he went into that temple and he prayed the high priestly prayer. In the first five verses, he would pray for himself. Then verses 6 through 19, he would pray for the immediate 11. And then in verse 20 through 26, he would pray for the believers to come. That would be you and me. He looked into the future and he saw that we would be in Memphis, Tennessee tonight. And he prayed of all the things that we might be one. When Jesus prayed that prayer of oneness, I can only imagine he's looking at the 11 and he looks out and he sees in the face of Peter. But behind Peter, he sees Pentecost and he sees John, but behind John, he sees Europe and Asia Minor. And then there's a gap in the circle that's been broken by Judas Iscariot, and he looks, and the face of Paul appears. And behind it, he sees the churches across the Mediterranean, and he sees the churches of Europe and Africa. And he prays, Lord, that thy might be one. <laughs> Jesus could have prayed a lot of things that night because he was working with a motley crew. Sometimes we read through the scripture so fast we miss the beauty of it. Look at what he's working with that he's going to entrust the future church in the hands of his disciples. These are people typically we would say to our daughters, do not bring to my house. <laughs> you got James and John the Thunderstorm Brothers. They're ready to call down fire on a whole community of people. You got a betrayer, you got a doubter, and a disbeliever, a denier. But when you talk about race matters, you got Matthew the publican who is sold out to the Roman Empire as a tax collector. This would be the equivalent of someone in World War II 
that is a Jew working on the side of the Nazi, and they would call him a Quisler. But not just Matthew the publican, you got Simon the zealot, an insurrectionist who has made a vow that he would kill every publican. Can you remember how much Jesus had to say, enough, man, enough? But Jesus could have prayed also because he's looking at his death in full tilt. And nobody would have blamed him if he would have prayed, Lord, not the whips, not the crown, not the nails, not the pain. He would have had every right to say that. And yet, what he prays is that you and I would be one. Let me just say one thing about that. Unity is not achieved. It's a gift granted by God. Tonight we're going to come to this altar and we're going to gather and we're going to pray and we're going to weep and we're going to cry and we're going to confess. But Bonhoeffer says in that I agree, confession without repentance is cheap grace. And repentance is not I just feel bad about something. It's changing our mind to make a decision to do something. And so tonight we ought to do something, and that is take the words of Jesus serious, and that is simply to say, I will pray for unity. Pastor Wes, how can God use the church to serve our divided communities? It's not just Unity is donated by God, but it's demonstrated by the church. You come to Acts chapter 2 and 4, you see these beautiful pictures of oneness, where the church is working together. They use this great word that we throw around, koinonia, for fellowship. And I had to tell some people once, fellowship doesn't mean that it's some fellows in a ship. They had all things common, and the commonality was the person of Jesus Christ. But it doesn't take long for unity to be disunified. You come to chapter 5 and you see the intrusion of disunity. And then chapter 6, this is where you start seeing racial divide, isn't it? Where the Hebrew women are complaining about the Hellenist women and now you got a problem on your hands. And then you look through the scriptures and she, you see all these places in Acts where the gospel is trying to break free. You see where the gospel, and when you read Acts and you get to the last chapter, the last verse, you know it ends in an adverb, unhinderedly. And it implies that the gospel is breaking through every kind of barrier. It breaks through the social and the cultural barrier, race and disability. It breaks through every false taboo. And then it breaks through every unheard of barrier. And so walls are built up. And walls have a way of dividing us and separating us and pushing us aside. One of my favorite poets is Robert Frost, and he wrote Mending Wall. And he tells the story from the narrator's perspective that he saw his neighbor and they would at the spring walk on the different sides of the fence so that they would clean up their spaces. And one day the narrator suggested to the neighbor, you know, we do this every year, why don't we just tear down the, the wall? I mean, why separate us? I mean, there are no cows to get out the yard and Nobody's animal is damaging anybody else's uh, field. And the neighbor makes a great statement. He just simply says, good fences make good neighbors. The narrator tries to persuade him to say, look, you need to move away from this antiquated way of living. But he goes back to the adage and simply says, good fences make good neighbors. I'm in Ephesians 2.14 now. 
where Paul talks about the wall coming down. That God is our peace and that he has made two one and he has disabled the wall of hostility and he has brought that wall down. And there are walls that need to come down in our communities. It doesn't matter what side of the political bench you sit on. I'm not being political at this moment. It's just an observation. It doesn't matter what color, culture, ethnicity you are. There are walls that need to come down. Every human being deserves fairness and equality and justice. Everyone. And there are walls that come down. You can pray unity, but then you have to work unity by demonstrating what unity really looks like. You remember that day we all cheered. June 12, 1987, Ronald Reagan says to Mikhail Gorbachev, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall, and we cheered. And that wall came down, government tore down that wall, but more than that, the young people of that community tore that wall down. And you and I have a right to dismantle some walls in our own culture, in our own communities, to tear down some walls. In Ephesians, there's the religious wall that needs to come down, but then there's the racial wall that needs to come down. And it's demonstrated through the unity of the church that we bring these walls down. There's a third thing that I want to say. That unity is distributed by individuals. Have you ever noticed that nothing great ever happens in mass movements? See, the challenge tonight is once we finish here, the goal is, is to uh, get together, let's write a dissertation, let's have a doctoral ministry project, man, let's have a master's thesis, let's have a brick group and rally. You want to kill something great, turn it into a mass project. Change happens one individual at a time. Now, I know what you're saying, but Wes, we're all here gathered together. Yes, we are. And we're all together one individual at a time. We'll go back to our places one at a time. One vote, one registration, one kind act, one benevolent gesture, one act at a time. People are always looking for something huge to do. You could just start with being nice. <laughs> and you could be nice to people that don't look like you. Most of you, you have no idea what it feels like to walk into a store and people already summarize that you must be a criminal. Most of you don't know how it feels to be stopped by a police officer just because you're driving black. And sometimes, and I can only speak for me out, dress up a certain way. I mean, dress up so they'll know this, this is a respectable person. I'm still asked, what are you doing here? You could just start by saying in your community, just be nice. You don't know Pat and you don't know Jim. Pat and Jim are friends of mine. Pat moved into a community where my wife and I, we moved in, we were the first people to move in this community. So we always felt like it was our community. 
I was welcomed by people that never identified themselves. They wrote an epitaph that was so vulgar. In the 10th hole sand trap, that I won't even give you the initials as not to disturb your night. They did have pretty penmanship, I give them credit for that. <laughs> One of my neighbors just came next door and said to me, Ralph, not everybody thinks like that. What I appreciated is that he said that, and he didn't pretend that it didn't happen. Because the people that were raking out the epitaph made this comment. I, I don't know what they were talking about. You see, these kind of denials is what keeps up disunity. Just call it what it is. That's how you get things started. Well, I said, Pat and Jim, you don't know them. Pat, bless her spirit, has gone on to be with the Lord now. They moved in our neighborhood, and they had three sons, and Pat was diagnosed with cancer soon after they moved in. She died maybe a year and a half later. They got to be very good friends to us. We never sat in each other's house. We never went anywhere together. We just became kind to one another, just nice to one another, even then to now. I remember coming home. My wife was cooking. I said, uh, we're eating all of that? She said, no, I'm cooking this for Jim and their children. Pat had succumbed to death by this time. And I saw what unity looked like in my kitchen, just one kind act at a time. You know, evangelicals used to be kind. I say that in tongue in cheek, but we ought to revisit our heritage. I hear evangelicals many times arguing and bickering about these social services like the child labors and prison law and workforce and all this kind of stuff. You know who started all of that? If I can just categorize, I don't like doing this, but I do this for a purpose of distinction tonight. It was, it was not progressive liberals who did it. You did it. You saw that children needed to be educated and you jumped in on public education. So that even though a person breaks a law and is in prison, that they are still a human being. And you talked about prison reform. You talked about child labor laws. You talked about hospitalization. Reclaim who we are. Reclaim it. Yeah, that's worthy of a clap right there. Reclaim it. Richard Balmer is a academic and just wrote a great book a couple of years ago about evangelicals, evangelicalism in America. And he cites the sources of it. And it's a beautiful telling of it. To go and reclaim what we have done. Why be ashamed of wanting to be decent to people? Reclaim who you are. And do it one kind act at a time. I'm done. Let me give you one last thing. Pastor West, how can the unified church, how can God use it to serve our divided communities? Well, unity is donated by God, is demonstrated by the church, it is distributed by individuals, but here's the last thing, and don't ever forget it. It's delimited by the world. The world can't create unity. And the world has tried it, but the world cannot create
create unity. There's no way that they can do it. They've reached out to create unity, but they have failed. Every liberal democracy, every liberal secular democracy have reached their limit. In government, universities, academics, divinity schools, seminary, reached their limit. They can't do it. They've tried it. They wrote every periodical, every seminar, every gathering, and they keep coming to the end that they can not do it. We didn't just come here to celebrate Dr. King, life or legacy, but his living legacy, his living legacy. When King came to the end of his life, he got weary. He got worn that last year and a half. He was tired. His shoulders had been bearing that weight. And his vision of the world was bigger than the South. It was bigger than just one thing. It got big. It was a big vision. It was not limited to one region. And many people started, stopped celebrating him and applauding him. But his vision was large and expansive, and he was tired. In one of his last interviews, he himself admitted the 1963 speech, I have a dream, and he said, but now I feel like that dream has become a nightmare. Maybe tonight one of the angels will get back to heaven and tell Martin it ain't no nightmare. It's a dream that's becoming fulfilled. It's a dream that will be a reality. There are people who are grabbing hold 50 years after your assassination, and they're believing that dream can become a reality. That's why we're here. What happens to a dream deferred? Does it dry up in the rays in the sun or fester like a saw and then run? Does it stink like rotten meat or crust and sugar over like a surface sweep? Does it sag like a heavy load or does it explode? King's dream is not deferred. It may have been delayed, but it ain't deferred. It just took some of us a little longer to catch up with what he really was talking about. I like King because he never came down from the mountaintop. He never got down in vulgar language and trashy ideas. He always saw the best in everybody, even when sometimes you wish he would go low, but he wouldn't. He wouldn't. He had his high eyes on something greater than that. 50 years ago, he would stand up at Mason Temple, and he's tired, he's tired, but he's going to go to church. They make him go to church. And uh, he really hadn't prepared anything from that night. He, he just started kind of meandering around with everything that he knew, and he was just talking. But then something happened. You know, it happens to preachers like that. Yeah, they, they, they just start talking around, and then something get a hold of them, and Next thing you know, something is moving, you're saying, go ahead now, go. The king started confessing at that moment that, that I, I don't fear anybody, I don't fear no man now. He says, I, I, I may not get that with you, I, I, I may not get in that with you, but I've been to the mountaintop. My, my eyes have seen the glory. Let me go back to John 17 because that's what Jesus was saying to his disciples when he was saying, I'm praying for you that they might see the glory. And there's something about when you see the glory. It's something about seeing glory that arrests your imagination. Some years ago, Sharita and I had taken our children and we had gone over to Switzerland and we said we're going to go down the river and we're going to take you up a train ride up into the Alps. And so this train was full of people and, and that is perched just going 
up, almost a perpendicular, just going up. And people were tight and, and they were restless and, and they were all fussy. And, and Ralph was nudging Renika and Renika's nudging Ralph and Ailes nudging both of them. And it's time to get up. And now we're moving and it's tight and loud and people are fussing. And then we go through a tunnel. And by the time we get through that tunnel and it's dark, people are still making noise. But then when we come out of the tunnel, it was the most glorious sight we had seen. All we could see was the heavens. And all of that noise on the train got quiet because when you stand in God's holy temple, all the earth got to be quiet. <laughs> 